Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru, and today we are back with yet another RTX 4090 review. This time around, we are checking out the beast. That is the Gigabyte Gaming OC model, complete with an absolutely massive cooler, dual BIOS, and a power limit that can be increased all the way up to 600 watts. Intrigued? Well, let's dive into the review. If we kick things off then with a look at the overall design of the card itself, we can see that Gigabyte has gone for an almost entirely matte black aesthetic, though the backplate is grey. I was a bit disappointed though to see that the shroud is made entirely from plastic, so I don't think it has the most premium look or feel, and if you contrast that with something like the Asus Tough version, which has an aluminium shroud, then I really think Gigabyte should be doing better, especially at the RTX 4090 price point. We just can't go any further in this review though without addressing the sheer size of this card, as it is actually the biggest 4090 that we have seen so far. Tipping the scales at a touch over 2 kilograms, it actually measures in at 340 by 150 by 75 millimeters, so is very nearly a quad slot card. It even manages to make the Founders Edition look relatively compact, which is no easy task. The size of the card has allowed Gigabyte to fit three 110 millimeter fans using their so-called unique blade fan design. As we've come to expect from Gigabyte as well, the central fan does spin in reverse compared to the others, and Gigabyte claims this just helps reduce overall turbulence thus improving airflow pressure down into the heatsink itself. We also find a bit of RGB lighting around the fans as each one is actually surrounded by an RGB LED strip and the Gigabyte logo on the front side of the card is also an RGB zone. Out of the box you can see here it does this sort of colour shift effect but you can of course customise this using Gigabyte's control centre software. Flipping the card over then to look at the backplate, this is made from metal and it features the Gigabyte and GeForce RTX branding printed in white. A massive cutout is also present towards the end of the card, allowing air to pass directly through the heatsink. Here we can get a look at the dual BIOS switch 2 with a choice of either the OC or the silent BIOS. Both offer the same 2625 MHz clock speed and the same power limit. The only difference is a small tweak to the fan curve, but we will test both modes later in this review. We can also note three screw holes on the end of the card, and this is actually where the included GPU support bracket screws into. Now, unfortunately, I do use a PCIe riser card for our PCAT power testing, so this support bracket won't work for my particular needs, but for normal users, I guess, it does look like a very smart way of eliminating GPU sag, so fair play to Gigabyte for including this. Next to the BIOS switch then, we of course find the 12VH PWR connector, and Gigabyte is including a quad 8-pin adapter. Standard display outputs are also used, though it is interesting to note that Gigabyte has opted for a dual-slot PCIe bracket instead of the triple-slot brackets that we have come to expect from other AIB cards. I'm not really certain why Gigabyte would have taken this approach. I don't think it really matters that much, but it is something to point out. Taking off the cooler now, we'll get a look at the PCB. And the first thing to note is just how compact it is compared to the actual length of the card itself. You can really see how much air will be going straight through the heatsink. The PCB itself uses a 20 phase VRM for the GPU and a 4 phase VRM for the memory using UPI UP9512 controllers. 50 amp Vichet SIC 653A MOSFETs are used across the board. Now, as for the cooler, slightly embarrassing for me, you will have to forgive me, I did take the card apart, but I must have just completely forgotten to actually film B-roll of the cooler, but I did get a photo, so we'll throw that up now. As we've come to expect, Gigabyte is using a vapor chamber that contacts with the GPU die via a copper base plate, also utilizing 10 6mm copper heat pipes. 
We can also notice a ton of thermal pads that sit on top of aluminium base plates, and these are used to contact the VRM and memory modules, with those base plates sitting on top of the huge aluminium fin stack. Gigabyte is also using thermal pads on the back plate, so that will just help to draw out a little bit of extra heat from the back of the PCB. That's going to do it then for our look at the design of the card, and it's time to move on to testing. For this, we are of course using our regular GPU test system for 2022, and this is powered by MSI. This system is based on Intel's i9-12900K CPU, paired with the MSI MEG Z690 Unify motherboard, and we've got 32GB of a Data XPG Lancer DDR5 memory. MSI's 4K MPG321 URQD monitor is used for all of our testing. Kicking off with thermal performance then, the gaming OC delivers solid results, with the OC BIOS recording a peak GPU temperature of 65.6 degrees, while the silent BIOS runs about 3 degrees warmer. The hotspot results are slightly higher than what we'd expect though, with about a 12 to 13 degree delta between the GPU and hotspot readings. And while the results are absolutely fine, the likes of the Inno 3D X3 OC and Palette GameRock OC do better in this regard. That being said, memory thermals are a clear high point for the gaming OC, with the OC BIOS keeping the GDDR6X temperatures at just 66 degrees, and that increased to 70 degrees when using the silent BIOS. That result is still the joint second best result on the chart. I was a bit surprised, however, to hear the levels of noise that I did from this card, with the OC BIOS seeing the fans spin up to about 1970 RPM, producing 41 decibels of noise. Thankfully, the silent BIOS is much more relaxed as we'd expect, with a fan speed of around 1660 RPM, and that produced 37 decibels of noise. I can also report that no coil whine was audible during my testing. For our noise normalized thermal testing at 40 decibels, we set the fan speed to 1880 RPM, and that saw the gaming OC deliver results comfortably better than the founder's edition, but still a few degrees hotter than the Inno 3D X3 OC and the Palette GameRock OC. Even the hotspot temperature is actually only a couple of degrees cooler than NVIDIA's Founders Edition. Memory temperatures though did remain at 66 degrees, and that is still a best-in-class result for the gaming OC when noise normalized. As for a quick look at total system power draw, the gaming OC does operate with a 450 watt power limit out of the box, so it's not a surprise to see that power draw of the entire system comes in basically right around all of the other 450 watt cards that we have tested. The gaming OC also has the smallest factory overclock that we've seen from any AIB card, with just an extra 25 megahertz added to the core. That means it's not a surprise to see its real-world operating clock speed was barely above NVIDIA's Founders Edition. Over our 30 minute stress test, it averaged 2696MHz using the default OC BIOS, and that's just a 13MHz gain over the Founders Edition in the real world. As a result of that basically negligible clock speed difference, our game benchmarks show the gaming OC delivers near identical performance to the Founders Edition. In fact, the gaming OC was never more than 1% faster than the Founders Edition across all five games tested, so the performance really is functionally identical. That's not necessarily a bad thing though, as after all, it is still an RTX 4090. Just don't expect any meaningful difference versus the Founders. Of course, we did also try our hand at some manual overclocking, and one cool thing here is that while the power limit is set to 450 watts out of the box, this can actually be increased all the way up to 600 watts for the gaming OC, and this is the same as can be done with the NVIDIA Founds Edition, but the gaming OC is the first AIB card which has also been able to do the same. With the power limit maximized, I was able to add 170 megahertz to the GPU and 1575 megahertz to the GDDR6X memory. This brought operating clock speeds up to 2910 megahertz in the real world, resulting in gains of 6% in Cyberpunk 2077, 
but then 8% in Spider-Man Remastered and Resident Evil Village. So the gaming OC was just outperforming the Founders Edition, but only by a fraction. So that is it for our look at the Gigabyte RTX 4090 Gaming OC. As AIB cards go, this one is very solid across the board, and I'd really say that it doesn't have any major weaknesses. Sure, the shroud is too plasticky for my liking, and it's admittedly huge, but I guess which RTX 4090 isn't? So as much as it doesn't have any major weaknesses, I would say that I'm also struggling to spot a clear USP for the gaming OC, in the sense that I couldn't really tell you one particular reason to get this card over the likes of the Inno 3D X3 OC or the Palette Game Rock OC, considering it did run a bit hotter and a bit louder out of the box. Now, please don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is a bad card at all, as like I said, it is still very solid across the board. I just personally feel that Gigabyte is maybe playing it a bit too safe. Part of me is wondering if for this generation, they're really trying to position the gaming OC cards as, I guess, a clear step down versus the Aorus Master as they have been fairly close in terms of overall feature set and cooling in the past, but that's really just speculation. Ultimately, if you are looking for an RTX 4090 and you do pick up the gaming OC, it will not disappoint. I just can't really say that it's blown me away. Anyway guys, that is going to do it for this review, so if you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, and as always, let me know your thoughts on this card down in the comments below. If you've already picked up an RTX 4090, I really want to know which model you went for, and why. Please do subscribe if you haven't already, and ding that notification bell so you can stay up to date with all of our latest videos, and why not come chat with us on our Discord server, which is linked in the description. While you're there, you can also check out a link to our merch store, and if you're feeling particularly generous, you could even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though guys, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.